Matthew, thank you so much for being my guest on Calling Caffeinated. What a pleasure to chat with you today. Thank you for being my guest. Oh, Stacey, I'm delighted to be here. Now, now we could, we may get, because this is my home office. Okay. So there's probably like a 25% chance you'll hear some rip roaring argument between kids out there, you know, done in love, but <laughs> the same. So, we well, run I'm, the same risk in my studio, AKA my bedroom in my house here. So no worries at all. I have toddlers running amok. So um, it's all good. The beauty of big Catholic families. How many children do you have? I have six kids uh, of Wonderful. age of 10 and, and 15 16. So okay. about a week away from uh, 11, uh, our only girl after five boys. And uh, so then I have a 23 year old down to almost 11. Wow, so. what an age spread, that's amazing. So yeah. the question that I ask all of my guests right off the bat is what calls have you received from God in your life so far? And what has receiving those calls looked and felt like? Ooh, uh, that's a big one. A, a nice, small, <laughs> nice, small question there. And while I'm at it, I'm going to answer all the, the other big questions of the universe. Uh, Perfect. <laughs> well, well, Stacey, I am not embellishing when I say um, that, that life has been unbelievable, actually. Uh, so I'm 55, um, and, I, and I grew up in a very... Uh, a unique, fun, dynamic family. And so from my late teens, um, started in a whole host of adventures. And so it's been a, an unbelievable 35 mm -hmm. years. And, and in my early 20s, so let, let's say two callings. In my late teens, I got challenged by a non-Catholic Christian on my Catholic faith. Mm -hmm. And I believe it was part of the master plan. And, and that created an awakening. And that awakening uh, eventually sent me into doing marketing and advertising in the secular world. But then I then brought it over into the church at about age 24, 25. Mm. So about 30 years ago, I began full-time working in the church. And, and during that time period, was able to uh, work for some pretty cool ministries and, and start a, a host of uh, different uh, ministries, uh, most of them national uh, Catholic ministries. So it's been an Amazing. unbelievable uh, 30 years of working for the church, working within mm. the church. And yeah. frankly, if anyone is watching or listening right now who's contemplating that, the first comment is, well, you do need to provide a temporal living for your family. That's your first obligation mm -hmm. for, uh, quote, saving, you know, outside souls. Um, but if you can find the living in the church, a real living, mm -hmm. whew, it has been unbelievable. It's been, it has had 10,000 bumps and bruises, uh, but it has had uh, 200,000 joys. And mm. so uh, those are two callings. The initial kind of waking up as a late teenager uh, to the glory that was the Catholic faith that I really didn't understand or know. And then the early to mid 20s, waking up to the vocation of working full time for the Lord in a variety of different capacities. Amazing. Yeah. You wrote the book. So this book, I believe in 1998, did Adam and Eve have belly buttons? And I was so excited to talk to you today because I have seen that book, I think on every bookshelf of every Catholic church library ever. Was that book the fruit of this a non-Catholic Christian who challenged your Catholic beliefs? Yeah, great question. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you've seen it everywhere. I think it's going to end up being on my tombstone, uh, which, <laughs> which, which I'll gladly uh, take. In fact, if you can indulge me after I give you the quick answer of telling you an anecdote about where Love I saw it. the book, where I saw the book one time. But yeah, and, and there's no doubt about it. Um, in mm -hmm. the late teens, early 20s, I had this kind of intellectual awakening. I got challenged. I was kind of teetering a little bit with maybe uh, leaving the church because I didn't know anything. I was almost going to embrace maybe this uh, friend's faith. But then I woke up and I started learning. And then the three to four years of learning eventually culminated in my being a youth minister. And my being a youth minister culminated in my gathering about 300 questions from Catholic teenagers. Uh, mm. The first 200 became, did Adam and Eve have belly buttons? And 199 other questions from Catholic teenagers. And then the next 200 became, did Jesus have a last name and 199 other questions? And, uh, and if you'll indulge me, um, mm -hmm. uh, at a certain point, my parents were older. My wife and I uh, took them on a, a cruise, a, a kind of Catholic cruise we were running. Hmm. Uh, 
up in Alaska, and my mom was older, so she couldn't really do any of the unique excursions of, you know, something wild. So we just went to some, uh, we heard about a chapel in the woods in in this port in Alaska, some mm. small little chapel about a half mile away. And so we went to this little teeny chapel in the woods, and right as we walked in the door, we looked at one of the, I looked at one of the tables, and my book was sitting right on the table. And uh, just the whole idea, I mean, to me, it was a signal grace. I mean, Crazy. You, you, you almost can't write that, you know, no. or whatever the phrase is. Um, that is so, that is so neat. That's, that's so beautiful. And you founded Ascension Press, which is, um, if so Ascension presents the whole umbrella. If someone I'm talking to has seen no other Catholic videos out there, I'll say, have you seen Father Mike Schmitz on YouTube? And they'll say, oh, of course. Yeah, yeah, I know Father Mike Schmitz. You know, he's the guy with the blue eyes. <laughs> and so everybody, you know, you've done a fantastic job, I think, of breaking through in new areas that other um, other companies haven't yet. And, you know, so you're a real pioneer using media at the, you know, at the forefront of, of the people we need or to the, the people we need to be reaching. So thank you for your excellent uh, work. I believe yeah. me, I'm the one ultimately blessed here. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And you are also the author of this book, which I literally received in my mailbox an hour ago. So oh. I got, I didn't read it in an hour. I read the digital copy um, a few weeks ago, but I got the physical copy, which is exciting. So this is Clear Conscience, A Catholic Guide to Voting. I was really excited to, to be able to read this because I think what we're seeking right now in a big way is clarity. We're mm. I think uh, so many Catholics are so confused. Um, certainly, you know, we have a Catholic candidate running for the presidency, but is that a good idea to vote for him? So, you know, it, and there's so much confusion. There's, there's so many big issues. And, um, you know, as I think about the voting world, you know, what Catholics have been expected to know, what people have been expected to know, before the internet, you read a newspaper Maybe you went and heard a, a, you know, a candidate come to your town and you heard him give a speech um, and you knew about your local issues, but you weren't expected to know what's going on in California or even necessarily the ins and outs of the Mexican border or uh, you weren't concerned with all of these huge issues. Um, and so I think our world has gotten very complicated and it's, it, you know, we're expected to know so much. So as we jump into this, um, one question that comes to mind is a quote that you wrote in Clear Conscience. So this quote is about natural law and reason. You wrote, mm -hmm. apart from God's revelation, is there any other standard by which we can measure the measure of human politics? Yes, and it is right reason, the standard of clear, rational thought. So I've heard our age today described as the age of emotion, which mm -hmm. I would very much agree with. You know, um, we just... We, you have one glance at social media, one glance at the news, and you just see, you know, that we're being fed messages and things that are very slanted. Um, and so if you're, if you give facts that oppose the popular narrative, you know, you're, you're canceled or you're labeled a bigot or a racist or whatever. So how can we find our way? What are some resources for people to find their way to this clear, rational thought? Um, yeah. And, and you know, as, as a Catholic, why, how do we seek that out? Wow. Uh, again, another great question. You're like three for three or four for four. <laughs> so, that's so good for you. Okay. <laughs> you. Well, um, uh, a few things. Uh, that, um, so uh, I, I would say that I think this generation... Um, is uh, contains both some of the most informed and and least informed. Now, least informed mm. may have been the case over the past two thousand years with the majority of people, mm. but, but it is kind of put on steroids. The least informed because everyone, um, it just it, because they they know enough to make some comments. Uh, everyone, I think, is is eminently more, more confident than uh, than they should be. Yet we do have this. Uh, it, incredible amount of content out there. And so people are fairly well versed simultaneously on, mm -hmm. on a whole panoply of issues, you know, some of which that you had mentioned. So how does one, how does one determine, oh, I got to turn down my, my phone. Um, 
Bone Beaver here, or whatever it's called. So we're not no worries. To, throughout our time. So how does one um, move beyond maybe the surface to deeper uh, understanding? I would say the first thing is, is every conversation that anyone who's listening, watching right now must have henceforth. We, we need to start by doing our best to, to remove emotion and, uh, and quite frankly, sentimentality. In other words, what we hope the answer would be. Mm -hmm. And we need to kind of wash away the dust and, and get down to the individual answers. I believe, Stacy, that if we were to take each one of the questions and slowly dialogue about it with various persons where they get a few minutes and then they get, you get the right notes on what they said, they get, you get a few minutes, that we would come a, a lot more close to answers. I actually believe that, um, and again, this conversation right now is not a pursuit or an advocacy out of the box for conservatism. Because as a, a person of goodwill, uh, I, I want the truth. Mm -hmm. But I believe the ma majority of people in life actually live conservative lives, whether they know it or not. For example, who among those who are listening right now would not say that it's a good thing to balance your checkbook versus winging it? So, I mean, mm -hmm. and, and we really approach things, uh, most things in life. If, if someone was watching right now who had children, generally speaking, they want safety and more predictability for their children. Mm -hmm. So I actually believe that, um, that if we were to slow down and look at each of these issues slowly um, and, and more systematically, that, uh, that we would achieve much more. Another thing though, to answer your, your uh, question, I think what I was gathering from it was mm -hmm. uh, beyond sentimentality, beyond the headlines, beyond our responses to those, how does one find truth? Um, I would say that, that uh, if God exists and there's an abundance of evidence that God does exist, that he would not leave us without clues and without answers. And as Christians, we would say that there's at least two or three or four places that we can we can hunt. One is called natural law. Natural law is the law that's written on all our hearts. It's written, written into the fabric of who Stacy is and who Matt is. For example, Stacy, you don't punch me in the chin because the Bill of Rights says you don't do that or the or some document, but because it just doesn't echo with your inner being. Well, that's mm -hmm. the natural law speaking to you, that you just don't hit me randomly. So natural law, but there's also something called revelation. Uh, first, the Jewish people had revelation, and then it was sort of, quote, perfected with the coming of Christ, infused with a new law, uh, a law to love one another. And then uh, there is the lived experience, um, the lived real-time teaching of the church in time, and, and Stacy, just a quick clarification. In vitro fertilization or cloning is not clear in the Bible. So what is a modern Christian to do right. um, on, on new developments in time? Mm -hmm. uh, where, where, um, you mm -hmm. need, number three, you need a teaching voice in the here and now. So natural law, mm -hmm. revelation, Old Testament, New Testament, and then a teaching voice. Um, a voice in the here and now. We also have private revelation as well. Absolutely. Yeah. So, and another just practical thing I would want to add to that maybe is um, I have been seeking data in a lot of the big questions that have come, um, that have come up this, certainly this summer, uh, there's been, it's tumultuous in our country. I've really been seeking data and seeking, uh, seeking facts as I, as I Google things. So just going beyond the headlines, here's one example. I have no problem, you know, expressing my views. You certainly do not have to say who you're voting for or any, you know, any political, uh, affiliation that you have, you know, but, um, but I have no problem not remaining neutral because it's my show. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to know, like, what, so we hear this, you know, Trump is a hateful person all the time. We hear that from the media all the time. He's, you know, he's all this hate speech. 
So I Googled, you know, what what is it that he said that is supposedly so hateful? And you can just Google Trump hate speech and you'll find these lists of, of things that he has said that supposedly are all racist. Now, I just kind of laughed my way through the list, Matthew, because um, <laughs> somebody wrote this very seriously thinking that people were going to take them seriously. And many of the things on the list were, you know, nobody actually heard him say this, but reportedly Trump said this. Or other things were um, in 1991 or whatever, Trump fired a, a person of African-American descent from, from his reality show, The Apprentice. Or Trump criticized Barack Obama for being a bad student. And when you logically look at those things, are those actually racist things? No. Some things I would argue are insensitive, but I have a, a I believe a well-formed enough mind that when you actually look at what's been said, you actually look at what's happened, I would not look at any of those things and say, oh, that is horribly racist right there. Um, even something like, you know, everybody knows about Trump calling the 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 coronavirus the Wu or the Chinese flu or whatever he called it. Mm -hmm. um, and people were all up in arms about that. Um, you know, we call things by their origin all the time, sure. you know, yeah. the great the British the yeah, Zika great virus, the Spanish, yeah. the Spanish influenza. Right. You know, do I think that it's even remotely racist to call it the Spanish uh, influenza or, or the Zika right. virus? Right. It's absurd. Right. The, the Berlin Wall, you know, Great Wall of China, you know, the Great British Baking Show. We name things by the play, by their origin a lot. And I distinctly remember reading in major publications about how they this coronavirus was nicknamed the Wuhan flu at the yeah. beginning back in March. And then I'm pretty sure all of the publications have since erased that since Trump called it the, the Chinese flu, but nobody had a problem, you know, as yeah. Washington Post was saying, calling it the Wuhan flu. So, you know, when we really look at the issues, really look at what's being said, I just want to empower listeners to, to do that for themselves. And, you know, certainly with all of the, the racial tensions that have been going on, you can Google statistics and data and facts you can we have access to those facts and you can really look up and try to do research for yourself um, that's kind of what i've taken it upon myself to do if you're losing your peace i don't you know you don't have to go that far and persist and persist in it but little bits at a time and um and i think it gives a clearer picture of you know what we're really looking at what's really being said what's really happening yeah. um so just want to empower people to do that too yeah look beyond um, cnn <laughs> No, that's great counsel. And let's go worst case scenario. Mm -hmm. let's, and by the way, I am not even 1% advocating this, but, mm -hmm. but this is the type of clear headedness and sobriety and um, calm. Let's say there is some element of a streak of racism in candidate A or candidate B. I mean, frankly, the opposing candidate, Joe Biden, I mean, corn pop, you know, a whole host of, of things that clearly, you know, you ain't black. So right. I think we can, because we can, we can play that whack-a-mole, you know, with, with mm -hmm. who said what, this is why I think you need to step back, uh, not you, but the collective you, need to step back and look at the, the, the host of issues. And at the end of the day, are you fundamentally for, let's say, more uh, individual liberty or more big government? Are you fundamentally for higher taxation or less mm -hmm. taxation? Are you fun, uh, fundamentally for looser mores in the culture or, or some things because of the ramifications, tighter mores in the culture? Mm -hmm. And so, I don't know, I, I, I you know, but here, here's the beauty part about it as my Southern friend uh, says, and I guess nowadays that might even be considered, uh, you know, uh, insensitive. Right. Um, yeah, you might have to apologize after this interview. I don't so know. whoever I offended, <laughs> I, I apologize, um, including including my wife, because we had a spat about an hour ago. Um, <laughs> so, um, so, what was I saying? So, um, this is why... It's oh, your southern friend. Yeah. Uh, right here. The beautiful part. Oh, darn it. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, that's okay. We got it's caught up in political correctness. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, this is what, which by the way, is actually a point. I think we're getting distracted with so many mm -hmm. second, mm -hmm. third, and fourth tier issues. We're straining yes. gnats and swallowing camels, mm -hmm. um, you know, with, with missing the big issues. But I couldn't agree uh, more. So, so I forget what point I was making. It was profound, though, I assure you. <laughs>
It was, it, it was going to be unbelievable. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It was going to blow everyone's mind. Well, you write know, to it, me and I'll put it in the show notes. Yeah, you know, as an old comedian, Steve Martin, who would be probably older. Well, maybe you know him from Father. I do. Time. I do. Yeah. Um, you know, when he was a stand up comedian in the 70s, he had a line. He said uh, he forgot something on the stage and he said, uh, well, it must not have been very important or I wouldn't have forgot it. So evidently my point was not that, you know, earth shaking. Well, I couldn't agree more with everything you did say, you know, just about clear headed thinking, um, really removing the the filter of emotion, which is so present um, so many places. Um, I agree with you. Um, oh, I thought of it. I thought yes. of what I, huh, what I forgot. Oh, so, perfect. Let's have it. And, and by the way, this is not a smooth segue into the book because I'm a Catholic before I'm a publisher. If I never publish anything again, great. You know, end of story. Um, and actually, just a little clarification. I'm one of about a half dozen contributors to the book. Uh, we we mm. released it just as the editors of Ascension. But this is this point is not about the book. But this is a foundational point. Um, in the book, we chose, uh, we addressed the individual issues. That's the second half of the book. The first mm -hmm. half of the book, we speak about principles. And these principles really are just very, very helpful. And they are, you know how I told you about natural law and then revelation and then you know, the, the teaching uh, church. Well, the teaching church gave us just a quick, for example, two guardrails to help mm. us determine um, certain, certain issues of economics, for example. The church has this brilliant concept called solidarity that you, Stacy, and I, and your husband, and my wife, and, and the people in Northern Virginia and in suburban Philadelphia, we are to have solidarity with each other to try and solve problems and help each other. So you got solidarity. Mm -hmm. But then the other guardrail is called subsidiarity. And subsidiarity is this brilliant concept that Christianity, the church, gave us that is the other guardrail where it says, well, wait a second, though. We do want to help people, but we want to help them really at the level that is closest to them, the most proximate level, the, the, at the closest level where they know the problem better and probably can handle it financially better. Mm -hmm. In other words, subsidiarity means small government. So in one hand, the church is saying, we're all in this together, but then it says, but it's best handled at the local level. So mm -hmm. those two guardrails begin to help you figure out issues of uh, economic justice um, and then a whole host of issues. So that, yeah. that's one reason why I know maybe uh, your, your audience may skew a little younger and therefore the phrase, quote, well, the church teaches might have less grip then maybe someone who might be 50, 60, 70, 80 years old because there was maybe greater respect and understanding of what the church was and is. Mm -hmm. But I would say to um, your listeners, your young listeners, um, the church lays out unbelievable principles to help give you a framework um, to begin to have a look at these individual issues instead of just is Donald Trump a racist or is Joe Biden racist. It, mm -hmm. it, uh, but Let's look at all the issues, which issues fall down to your prudential judgment, your individual mm -hmm. judgment, and which truths are immutable that under no circumstance can we ever violate them. That's another principle, by the way, uh, that right. we have in the book. So We are gonna, definitely going to get into that. But actually, what you just brought up is a really great discussion on, or a really great segue into one point I wanted to ask about, which is uh, has to do with poverty, how much the government is actually supposed to provide for poor people. So, um, you know, it's interesting. I think as we move farther and farther away from being a God-centered society, a church-going society, we look more and more to the government to replace some of those programs that typically you would find in churches. And so, you know, we've got people who think, really think that we should support all of these new welfare problem, uh, welfare programs. When in reality, welfare programs really weren't part of the the federal government, you know, historically. And um, my husband and I really believe, you know, in a smaller government, as as you were mentioning before, where you do handle things more at the state level, more at the local level. You actually quoted the catechism and you said, primary responsibility does not belong to the state, 
but to individuals and the various groups and associations that make up society. So why is this primary responsibility for the poor not given to the state, uh, states in the you know, government institutional uh, way, but maybe more individual states? And yeah. you know, why is that often a better way to go about eradicating poverty? Yeah, and, and um, uh, so I'd start by saying, when we speak about the government, um, you know, first off, who or what is the government? You know, one thing Stacey I say is, it's the nature of my waste to get bigger unless I consciously work against it. Mm. In other words, it's um, really the nature of a bureaucracy because especially when the parts are somewhat disconnected, mm -hmm. um, to, to really grow and, and metastasize uh, because again, individuals with self-interest are in there and uh, the bigger it gets, the more blind one gets to what the moving parts are. So it's very easy for uh, the big to get bigger and the unhealthy big to get bigger. Um, so the second thing I would say is when you and I use the phrase or whomever uses the phrase the government, um, how do we know that the persons in the government uh, are angels, are working in the best interest, are working vigilant and diligently. Mm -hmm. Generally speaking, generally speaking, um, at the local level, there ends up being more accountability because there ends up being more visibility. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, you really can hide less. But, but the greater reason why is, um, I would say, is because uh, written into the natural law of all 7.3 billion persons, um, it really is, I, I would say, uh, even with the fall, the, the original sin fall, is an impulse towards the other. We were hardwired for to be gift. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I would say that uh, if I were a betting man, um, and I am because my tax dollars are getting spent every day, mm -hmm. um, uh, I would say that, that humanity will fill in the vacuum I, I am comfortable with the idea as the state as a fallback fallback safety net, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. but but I generally think that that the churches the individuals will step up first. I mean, here's the proof. Uh, the proof is like if a tsunami happens in Sri Lanka, you know, and it's an, you know, people are going to step up. Americans in particular are going mm -hmm. to step up, step up. So so I would say um, when we speak about the government. I think we automatically often associate angels, you know, perfect persons are, are in there pulling the levers perfectly. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot of, uh, lot of hope in, the, in that statement, like wishful uh, thinking in that statement. Mm -hmm. If I were to cast my lot on, on where something is going to be more appropriately handled, it's probably going to be at a more proximate level. And it's probably going to be from people who are giving, and this is a key line, are giving not as much for self uh, gain or even self-preservation as in the case of keeping one's job, but, but really due to a conversion of sorts, whether it's a deep conversion or a modest conversion. So I just think that, that there, there are, there's no perfect answer. There's, um, there are pr uh, problems in government and there are individuals who, who don't want to get off the couch and do anything. But generally speaking, and your listeners should make informed decisions based on generalities, not specific anomalies. Mm -hmm. Generally speaking, um, people are, are good and, and the churches are in, quote, the business of helping with very little financial gain to themselves, mm -hmm. whereas the government is inherently more kind of self-serving, the preservation of one's jobs, the preservations mm -hmm. of allowing a bureaucracy to become bigger. So if I were a betting man, I would say in seven out of 10 instances, the individual and the entities are going to, to lead more effectively. Absolutely. Yes. And I think about times when I have been in need, you know, I had two babies in um, less than two years. You know, I had Irish twins. So they were uh, less than a year apart. Wow. And I had people from our church bring me meals. And that was receiving that kind of you know, we weren't in financial crisis, so that, that was a difference, but 
to have it, receiving aid in that way where someone brings a meal to your house, it gives to the person who gives as well as to the person who receives. And it is such a more personal way of receiving help. And, you know, the Catholic Church is the largest charitable institution in the world. Um, you know, we get so much flack, but honestly, there is there is so much happening that we give to, you know, so many charities, so many uh, local crisis pregnancy centers, they outnumber Planned Parenthoods around the country 20 to 1. Mm. So there's so much that, that the Catholic Church is doing. And, um, and I think it's less, I think in people's minds, maybe it's a little bit less safe to rely on that because maybe they just don't know about what's in their hometown, or maybe they're like, well, if I just, you know, if I don't vote for someone who's going to expand these government welfare programs, what's going to happen to me if I ever need to go on welfare? Um, yeah. They don't really trust. But I think that comes from a lack of community. I think that comes from us being behind our screens and having fewer people that we interact with on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, you walk down the street in America, you may see some kids outside playing, but by and large, we're all in our homes a lot more. We're not out there talking to each other and building that sort of that community. So you have to be really intentional about it. So that ties into a much, 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 much larger problem. But I agree with you. I would rather donate my my money to a charitable organization in my hometown than um, be required to give my tax dollars for, you know, uh, larger expansion expansion programs and like you said it's not it's not so cut and dry like some welfare programs probably should exist but but the expansion of them and looking to the government as if it's god is not is not healthy i think agreed agreed mm -hmm. yeah yeah so huge issue we we definitely have to talk about um we have to talk about absolute versus prudential judgment issues so there's a quote from your book. You wrote, the church distinguishes between absolute inviolable moral imperatives and prudential conclusions. Catholics, this is key, Catholics are not free to reject the church's absolute moral imperatives without falling into serious sin. This is an important distinction to keep in mind when politicians reject an absolute moral position of the church, but hold the same prudential positions as you on any number of issues. That if there's one thing that I want uh, to put out into the world from our, there's a lot of good things we've said already, but I think this is such an important thing for gaining clarity for Catholics. Yeah. So what are the issues where the church holds an absolute moral imperative and what are the issues of prudential judgment? Yeah, um, uh, and I'll, I'll get that in just a second. So uh, the reason people are surprised to hear this, Stacy, but mm -hmm. it's true. And to me, as one who studied the faith for 35 years and, and understand it, you know, I think I, I knew this, but um, the church actually gives staggering freedom uh, to the individual on the majority of policy issues that exist out there. Mm -hmm. So let's say there's 30 big political issues. Um, uh, the church really, like on 27 of them, you know, leaves it up to your own, God willing, well-formed prudential judgment where you researched and, and the, the merits of the argument have you land on this side or this side. Mm -hmm. um, the church um, really, again, wants to give us these principles. Again, you know, solidarity, sub subsidiarity, and under mm -hmm. subsidiarity, they ask for reciprocity that when it, you know, they want the, the, the giver and the, the receiving to, to have this reciprocal relationship. Again, the, these principles. And um, it, it also really believes that, that society should be governed by natural law. The opposite of, of natural law would be positivism, where basically we're rewriting it as we go. Whatever the sentiment of the age is, well, let's, you know, if we want to start enslaving people again, well, that's the sentiment of the people. So let's start doing that. Um, that would be, you know, really kind of uh, creating new law based on, uh, you know, popularism or just mm -hmm. the, the will of a judge. So, so the the short a answer uh, to your question is the church wants us to have a well-formed kind of worldview rooted in the natural law with various principles. Why? Because the church doesn't want you know, let's say some policy comes up in your town, you know, in your state of Virginia, 
The church doesn't want you to have to go to the church, knock on the door, get in line, wait until the bishop can see you, and then and then you discuss it with him, and then you take it back. No, it needs you and me and everyone listening to be nimble. It's the only way we can be leaven in the culture is if the Christians or the people of goodwill are nimble. So therefore, the best thing is to form people's minds with principles and and revelation and reason and and again unearthing the law that's written on our hearts and then have them go out. Otherwise, the process would be very, very slow. So Absolutely. the church gives them great freedom. It wants us to be nimble. So, um, but on the issues, um, we can kind of cut to the chase. On economic policy, Christians of goodwill could differ on whether program A, B, C, D, E, or G are best. For example, some would say that um, to simply give welfare um, to people in a blanket form can create a whole host of disincentives. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, you know, welfare maybe should be tied to, to something. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not the antichrist if I hold that position. I'm not an evil person. In fact, some might make the case that the person who ties an element of responsibility to something might actually be even more loving than, than the person who just wants to write the easy check or, or sign up for the easy check. So, um, so uh, on issues of economics, it falls under prudential judgment. We're supposed to have an instinct, a, a, an impulse towards those in need. We're supposed to have this prefer, preferential option and love of the poor. And so that's, that's one of those guardrails but it doesn't mean that I get to go and take your and your husband's check, 65% of it, and decide as the government that hey, I'm going to take your check and I'm going to decide for you. No, the church doesn't allow that, that, that blanket confiscation. There is something called private property that is, that is you know, one of like the four, and I have a list here, four minimal things that, that the church asks the government to honor. And so, so let me get to it. So the issue of guns, that's preferential, uh, you know, prudent judgment, you know, mm -hmm. immigration. Uh, I would say to someone, the church would say, we're, we're supposed to kind of welcome the stranger in a general sense, but a nation absolutely has the right to determine self-determination, its mm -hmm. culture and its borders. Um, I mean, how is it a charitable act to, um, to make ourselves vulnerable? H how is it charitable to the other 330 million people to make mm -hmm. ourselves vulnerable? So the principle is welcome to the stranger, but the application, it, the church allows us to have it be a strict uh, application or a wide, as long as the principle is maintained. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, capital punishment, uh, there is a prudential judgment. Now, the recent popes, uh, Francis and, and um, Benedict and John Paul, have, have restricted it more and really said, you know, we're capable of incarcerating people and keeping them from harming others. Mm -hmm. um, and it's contributing to the culture of death. So, we really, really, really need to do our best to, to have this not be a part but it still acknowledges that there is the right of the state to administer right. punishment mm -hmm. if it feels it has no other real recourse mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. or if it wants to make the crime commensurate with the, the penalty. So uh, let me see other issues. I got some written down here. Um, uh, racial justice. The church says it's a sin to, to, um, to, uh, to hold perspectives and hold people down simply because of the pigmentation of my skin or your skin or, or someone mm -hmm. else's skin who uh, may be African-American or, or Hispanic or Indian or whatever the case may be. No discrimination against me. I can't discriminate against them. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it's sinful. Um, but how we apply that and live that out and what policy we set, well, that's up to you and your husband and, and the governing people Everybody. in Northern Virginia and, and here in, in uh, in the nation, uh, up in my area of the woods as well. So guns, um, war, uh, poverty, uh, war, the church, as you know, uh, has a just war principle where it again has principles. So I would encourage the young uh, people, especially, but really anyone who's listening, 
Um, and again, this is not about our selling a book. We're going to be fine. We got other books that we, we can sell. But I say this, whether it's our resource or, or other resources that would echo the, uh, the church's worldview, that um, we have some principles in here, the principles of just war, that the church says four conditions have to be met. Mm -hmm. But leaders can still make mistakes. I mean, the church hasn't definitively revealed in the manner that is revealed on issues of euthanasia, you know, abortion and, and a few other issues as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So I was actually really amazed by how in the book, you know, and I knew this already, but as well, most things I knew, but there, I was very surprised by some of them, some of the areas that are prudential judgment, and there are so few that are absolutes. Um, and one thing that you touched on in many of your different answers was kind of arriving at the most compassionate compassionate answer. And um, I thought it was interesting, uh, you know, you brought up some really good points about how sometimes what appears to be the most compassionate isn't always the most compassionate. And I, I do find this, it goes back again to that logical, rational thinking that we were talking about earlier is there's such a huge emphasis on appearing compassionate. You know, you want to appear that you care, but, um, but it's more important to do the caring thing than to appear that you care. And um, I think this is one of those areas where sometimes people can rag on the church for being very strict, you know, saying that abortion is a sin and, and they'll, they'll pull out the, you know, this is compassion for women. They'll pull that card. Um, uh, another area too, and this isn't something that the church has ever spoken on, but I hear a lot of Catholics I respect really raising a lot of questions and a lot of issues about the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, that's one of the areas where I've really taken it upon myself to just try and look at the data and try and look at the facts. And, you know, while, like you said, racism is a sin, Black lives do matter. That in itself is a concept that is, you know, rational and true. But if you look at the, you know, Black Lives Matter Inc., if you go to their website, there are um, things that they are teaching. Uh, sometimes they're teaching now in public schools. Um, one of their principles is that is that they want to disrupt the Western prescribed nuclear family. So this is a Marxist principle. This is a something that is, you know, it's highly dangerous. It's anti-capitalism, anti-personal property, anti-family, you know, ultimately really anti-religion. Um, and so you want to kind of dig beneath the, the issues to say, all right, if I donate to Black Lives Matter, even if I'm believing that, you know, it's the most compassionate thing, is this really, you know, raising those questions, is this really, is my money really going to this cause that I think is, you know, compassionate? Um, yeah. And yeah, yeah, that's kind of a side so, comment, but yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, again, uh, there's so much that, that we can discuss. And, and I know. Our, which is great. <laughs> um, so, uh, you just triggered uh, something uh, again, you know, how I spoke about subsidiarity and solidarity and, yes. uh, uh, you know, prudential judgment and immutable laws. Well, uh, the church also has commentary and it's connected to the black side of matter in, in the whole Marxism question. Mm, uh, mm -hmm. The church positively comes down against collectivism, really economic policies that would remove the individual's, freedom and, and uh, ability for personal destiny for the sake of a collective. Um, so those of your listeners who would uh, fancy themselves, quote, conservative, um, would celebrate that statement. Conversely, the church would say that pure economics, where the economy is an end unto itself, disconnected, from its, its ramifications on the individual human person and its dignity um, needs to be rejected as well in terms of, of, of an absolute kind of recourse to economic principles. Now, mm -hmm. that being said, clearly the church would fall down on, on, on the, the lean aggressively in the direction of, of free market. Um, but it would, and it would not be out of line. This is why I think libertarianism, although I get the instincts, I think is, is not fully mature because um, just like it would not be a fully mature response. What's your husband's first name? John. John. So it would not be a fully mature response for John and Stacey or Matt and Marianne to just kind of 
let our kids determine most everything. Well, that's mm -hmm. absurd. You know, not only due to their age and life experience, but but due to a whole host of other circumstances. They're just not prepared to deal. So mm -hmm. this is a big, long-winded way of saying rejection of collectivism, Marxism, communism, rejection of pure, un unadulterated capitalism. So therefore, the church would say that reasonable regulation, it, reasonable um, swings in, in the pendulum in the other direction are likely needed, mm. uh, you know, mm -hmm. at, at all times. But the impulse, though, and you know this, Stacey, the impulse is in the direction of freedom and one's uh, economic and, and, and other destiny. Therefore, those of your your listeners, um, if, if they need to kind of get closer uh, to where they start landing their decisions, um, really look at... at, at human aspiration and freedom on morally neutral areas, uh, economics and, and, and things like that, they, they should really kind of err in the direction of more conservative principles. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I tend to think that big government uh, persons tend to be a little bit uh, lazy and not wanting to sort of like balance your own checkbook. Uh, they, 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 they would rather just kind of let it be done for them. Okay, take mm. an extra 7% or 17% from my paycheck and just kind of figure it all out. I believe that's not honoring the Christian, the highest faculty we have as Christians, our intellects and our uh, highest natural faculty. So I don't know. I think people, uh, people are wired actually in a more conservative direction than they're allowing their minds to really know and, and believe. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. When thinking critically, it's so, it's so easy to fall into, well, yeah, we need to, I should vote for someone who is in favor of expanding this or the collective, whatever, or, you know, it, it, I can understand how that's such a, temptation and it can feel so uncompassionate to vote for something you know for a reduced government reduced in size but i believe you know that's really what the founding fathers wanted that's really you know why our constitution has kind of stood the test of time and why it's good in many ways is that it's the goal is to let people live their lives live their individual freedoms and have the freedom of you know f uh, freedom of religion and um, free speech and so forth um and for the government to only kind of step in where needed yeah, yeah. before so, oh go ahead mm -hmm. um so uh, again i'm not sure how we're doing with time i presume we're getting near the end so the takeaway for those who are listening i would say is this mm -hmm. line up let's say your john smith jane doe your 10 issues immigration, economic policy, and then look at the two candidates. And, um, but look at the, the two or three issues that are immutable. In other words, uh, the church would say that the right to life, the right to life, um, you know, it's the very spark of God from the beginning in, in the, the, the creation of, of a new life. So valuable is the beginning starting point of the right to life that it really does trump all nine others. And if one of the candidates um, is not passive on the issue or neutral on the issue, but seems to actually be pro, uh, proactive either in defense of life or, or countering this, this most important issue, that almost should be a, a um, you know, in and of itself, uh, the the single you know the single issue you know yes I would contend that there is an element where we can be single issue voters when the single issue is so egregious like can you imagine if if one of the two candidates was really good on nine issues but was really really fine with human sex trafficking mm -hmm. end right. of story I mean Forget end it. of story it, it's so egregious absolutely but, but I would contend that both candidates on seven of the nine issues, eight of the nine issues or so, their judgment call issues as to what is better, but on the issue of life, that one. Mm -hmm. regardless of what you think of Trump uh, or, or not, uh, and Pence, the bottom line is they are aggressively defending that foundational issue. 
Absolutely. Um, now we don't get into this in the book. We just give principles. Right. Um, right. But doesn't tell you who to vote for. It could be applicable for any election. But I heard. Um, so uh, I don't know how much if you're on Instagram, but there's a guy. I don't even know his last name. His name's Austin. His handle is the Basic Catholic, and he did a video, and I really like this analogy where he said you can't um, you can't say that Hitler was a good leader. Um, because the trains ran efficiently or there was reduced crime in Germany or, or whatever, he was killing millions of people. And so you can't, you know, you can't look at other issues as though they're equal, as though they're all equal to this one issue of the fact that he was committing genocide of a whole nation, of, you know, a whole race of people. Um, you just, you can't equate those two things. Um, nobody would look back in the history books and say, oh yeah, you know, he did, he actually did a pretty good job. No, we don't, <laughs> we don't do that, you know? Um, and I think, I, I, I'm, I'm glad we're talking about this. I would definitely wanted to talk about it before I let you go. Um, abortion is, it was a struggle. I've always been pro-life, but it was a struggle for me when I was young and woke in college and musical theater major, you know, <laughs> to, um, to be, you know, a, a single issue voter. And I'd hear my parents talk about it and I'd be like, oh, there's so many other things that are, you know, so important. But I, my thinking has really, or not more important, but as important perhaps, or you have to kind of look at everything. But my thinking has really come around as I've gotten older to the point where I would say that if one of the major parties has on its platform abortion in any capacity at any point in, you know, in field development, it's a huge disservice to the American people because they're putting themselves out of the running for the Catholic vote. It's not that we have the problem as being single issue voters. It's that they have the problem. They are not starting with a fundamental principle that must be defended by everyone because this is written into our hearts. This is written into, um, into our natural law. Um, but I see out there, I see a lot of people and this, when I post something pro-life on, you know, Facebook or Instagram, I always get at least one person commenting, oh, so if you're so pro-life, why haven't you adopted um, any children by now? Um, you must be for uh, all of these other issues like, you know, you must be defending um, immigration, you must be, or all the immigrants, you know, basically open borders, you have to, um, you could even take it so far as to say, like, you should be vegan because animal life matters too. Like, if you're pro-life, you have to be pro-life in all of these areas. Um, and that's what's known as the seamless garment theory sure. that's kind of surfaced in 1976, and it's kind of been a logical um, flaw, you know, that's been like haunting us in the pro-life movement ever since. Um, but why is this thing, this garment theory kind of, uh, you know, why is it not true or is there anything about it that is true? Yeah, well, the instinct is certainly true. The, in, the impulse, the impulse yes. behind of, of wanting to value and respect the many manifestations of where the human person needs to be reached, ministered, and and yes. tended for, you know, in, mm -hmm. in some manner. Maybe the analogy is that um, if you and John were to come across a person bleeding in the street, uh, like like they're hemorrhaging, mm -hmm. you need to you need to stop that hemorrhage before you decide should I take them to this hospital, this hospital, this hospital. No, you need to stop the hemorrhage. The pro life issue, the the abortion issue, the right to life none of the other issues matter we can't get to the racism issue we can't get to the immigration issue for that person that mm -hmm. person is bleeding we can't get to them until that is stopped so the right to life is the the advent of all the other issues all the other issues don't get experienced if the person is not living and functioning so we must affirm as catholics that the impulse behind maybe the the seamless garment uh, world view is a good impulse. It's it's a preservation of the good. It's a seeking is a seeking to support the dignity of the human person. But there is a hierarchy of of truths and and realities. Mm -hmm. And the the preeminent is is the right to literally take that first breath, and and to, and to live unmolested in the, in the grand uh, first sense of the word of being able to live. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I get the instinct. Um, I would say, though, that that most of those other issues, let's say there's the 10 biggies, um, they're prudential judgment issues as, as to how best to help the poor. 
I mean, some will make the case, as we've spoken of earlier, that um, me just giving allowance to my kids without, my mom used to say, give with this hand and ask with the other, you know? And um, so, so the other issues, here's the takeaway for the audience, I believe. If you look at the 10 issues, the overwhelming majority of them, people of goodwill, real Christians, non-Christians, but of goodwill, they could differ on the best policy to administer racial justice or mm -hmm. uh, protect or not protect the borders. But there are some issues where when you're dead, you know, before you even take your first breath, you're dead. And so we must protect the, the right to life first. Mm -hmm. And and if, if I spoke about Pence and Trump earlier, if Biden and Harris were merely neutral on the issue, but I'm sorry, they seem to be far from neutral on the right. issue. Um, right. uh, uh, one of the two seems fairly militant and one seems, uh, the presidential candidate seems staggeringly tolerating you know, mm -hmm. of it at best. Um, so I, I think Harris is, is potentially militant in this regard. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and Biden, uh, uh, in my view, is, um, is is he's in it's a dangerous position uh to to hold his position mm -hmm. uh mm -hmm. and and so i just some would say his position to be just read them uh, would be militant even if not they're incredibly permissive on this mm -hmm. most pressing of issues and That's therefore i just don't know how you can stack up prudential judgment issues against the immutable uh truths of of abortion and, and euthanasia and, and just a few other issues. I agree with you. I could not agree more. Um, there's there's a million ways that we could take this, but I, I should, oh, did you have something else you wanted to say? Well, mm -hmm. I did, because I, I sense that, with that it, so we took a position in this book where we didn't take a position. We just mm -hmm. laid out the principles. And so as I was um, editing the book originally and then reading it, in preparation for interviews a month or so ago, and then reading it again for some interviews um, recently, um, I thought, is this a book that can be given to someone that you're arguing with? And I thought, you know, we handled this in a gentle, um, erudite way, but very, very popular, very accessible. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think people uh, on, let's say, uh, the side that would be contrary to, you know, Catholic teaching in, in some key areas, would read this and be surprised. And, wow, okay, I never thought about that idea of solidarity. Mm -hmm. Great. But also subsidiarity. And right. um, so I think um, I, I would just say that although it, it sounds as if I'm coming down on one side and I am, uh, uh, personally, the book, though, is uh, is more about putting proper guardrails in the minds of, mm -hmm. of persons. And so it really is, and, it, and it's handled gently and lovingly. So I think it actually is a resource that can be given to someone who might hold, um, uh, you know, liberal left-leaning, you know, uh, principles. I agree. And it's a pretty quick read too. You know, you really can, you can power through it. It's a, it's a fantastic resource for someone like me, who does know enough to, like you said at the beginning of the interview, you know, I know enough to know some things, but I can't be a hundred percent confident on every issue. And so it really does kind of give you that in a very manageable time frame. you'll be able to, you know, really discern how you're called to, to vote in the particular election and what, what's in your responsibility to defend and protect and what is the, what are these areas of prudential judgment. So yeah, <clears throat> I would like to finish just with a little um, defense of patriotism. This is something I noticed there's so much cynicism in our world, um, even to the point where it's so sad, you know, I think people say things hopefully just on behind a screen that they wouldn't say in real life. But anytime I, I you know, post something about abortion, uh, someone will say, oh, you know, the, we have such a messed up world, these children are better off dead, you know? And so we have so much cynicism or, uh, you know, these babies, they're never gonna have to suffer. So it's better that they, you know, that they're dead. And um, But even for those of us who are living and adults, we have just 
you know, our sense of patriotism, I think, has been eroded. Um, certainly, we just had September 11th the other day, and I was missing that sense of of patriotism that followed that tragedy, that sense of really pulling together. Now, this summer, we have, you know, boycotting, people boycotting Fourth of July, defund the police, just historical figures, including saints being pulled down, you know, and there's a lot of, we have the institutionalized kind of um, you know, slavery in our history, which is a, a sin. And we also have um, now currently we have abortion that is part of our, you know, part of our codified law. So how do we kind of maintain patriotism? How do we just not give up on politics when we have uh, such a melee of, you know, institutionalized and confusion about just, uh, you know, patriotism. Like, it's actually surprising that the, the church actually, you started out at the beginning saying that, the, you know, the church really commands patriotism as long as the laws are good. So how do we kind of maintain that with all this cynicism? Oof. Um, well, <laughs> big question. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so let me just echo a principle. So, let's say you and I are raised in a family. You know, we're siblings. We're raised in a family where there were some issues. There's some alcohol issues, and you know, the lunches were, or the meals were not the best, and birthdays were missed. But on the whole, it was stable and and good and moving forward. It was bumpy, but it was moving forward. Mm -hmm. um, we would have a right to complain about, you know the lackluster birthdays and the missing meals and, and, uh, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, but we would have, we would be duty bound to be thankful to, uh, the mother and father who, despite their flaws, were moving the, the apparatus forward. Mm -hmm. I, I would contend that, that America, um, although it has its issues and, you know, I don't know. I, 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 would, I would compare us to any other country in the world and their issues. Mm -hmm, I think mm -hmm. we, we got to be at the very top, if not among the top. But even yeah. if we're like, you know, in the top 15 percentile, let's say, or 20 percentile, there is a duty to have our heart in the direction of the, the entity that, that birthed us, nurtured us, raised us. Mm -hmm. uh, and from which we gain the spoils. I mean, I, I think of all the modern young kids who fancy themselves um, desiring Marxism, and I ask them, do you think you'd have your your, your iPhone? I mean, right. you, you're not creating the, the iPhone in Romania, you know, 40 years ago. It, it, right. it's, it's, it's all of what you're living on in everyday life, the car that you drive, the bus you take, whatever the case may be, man, that was born from a system mm -hmm. and, and uh, flaws and all. So there's a big, long an answer, winded answer, as most of Love mine it. are. It's great. Um, that, that we have an impulse towards patriotism, all of us, whether it's me or Colin Kaepernick, we have to have an impulse towards thank you, mom and dad. Mm. Thank you, country. I mean, if the, if the issue of slavery continued for another 200 years to the present day, like overt real slavery, like mm -hmm. we hear about in other countries now, right. well, then you absolutely have a mega, 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 mega beef with the country now. Mm -hmm. um, but I would contend, you know, uh, what's it, five, six 600,000 Americans lost their lives fighting against, um, it, you know, the, the institution of slavery. Um, uh, we really have come a, a long, long mm -hmm. way. And, and I think we, we were moving in the right direction. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So I would say, have your beef. I got my own beefs. Have your beef. I got, I got a whole host of beefs on, on institutional laws that exist right now in America. Mm -hmm. But there is a love of country in a similar manner that there is a love of my mom and my dad who mm -hmm. bumps and all raised us, uh, took care of us and raised us. So Absolutely. Yeah. If you expect perfection this side of heaven, you ain't going to find it anywhere. And the United States is definitely uh, the best the world has ever had, really, I think. 
Um, yeah. And I, it, it, yeah, it does hurt personally in a way to think about all of the people who are out there posting on Instagram, how they're going to boycott 4th of July. And my grandpa fought in three wars and put his life on the line, you know, three separate occasions in very big ways. Um, and he was recipient of a purple heart for wounds sustained in battle. So many courageous men and women have put their lives on the line for this country and many have died for this country. And it's because they, they believe in it, you know, and I, I think it can only benefit us to, like you said, have our beef and acknowledge that it's, um, that it's a nuanced conversation. It's not all one does not be all one way or all the other, but you know, we're all imperfect, but we all are worth, you know, our country is worth, worth loving. Um, I don't know if you saw the Republican National Convention, Senator Scott, I think his name is Tim Scott. Tim Scott, um, South yeah, 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 yeah. He, he spoke, I just loved how he spoke so movingly. He said, you know, his grandfather, um, he's the first uh, black man to have been elected to both the House and the Senate. And he said that his grandfather had to cross the street when he saw a white man because of the Jim Crow laws. And he said that, you know, his grandfather lived to see his grandson elected to the house and the right. Senate. Awesome. I know I, it just got me. He was like, we're not where we want to be, but we have come so far. And I think that's a potentially a good sentiment to leave this interview on is, is hope, you know, hope that we are, that our system is worth um, defending. It's worth taking that trouble to go to the polls and, you know, to, to figure out these issues for yourself and enter into that conversation and not just give up on our whole system. Well, and, and there's actually a, a Christian duty as a son and, and daughter of the country. Um, mm -hmm. And really as, as a Christian, there, there is a, uh, an obligation that we have to be a steward of the country and, and voting, you know, is part and parcel of that. Mm -hmm. so, yes. Um, Absolutely. So, well, so many things we could discuss, but, um, uh, <laughs> yes. you know. I'll, I'll I hear my questions. little ones downstairs. They're going, dinner, mommy. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. Very good. good. Well, yeah. well, God bless you. Uh, congr uh, congratulations on your show. I'm hearing great things. And uh, Thank I, you. I saw your website. And I'm going to look at some of those other interviews you had. So good on yes. you. Best wishes to you and John. And you Thank know, you so it's, much. It's your, your third child. Yes, thank you so much, Matthew. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for bringing so much clarity and just, um, you know, re just really solid principles that everyone can take with them. This is going to be a really, really great interview to release great. my listeners. So thank you. Right. Thank you, Stacey. God bless. God bless you.